Welcome to A Dram of Outlander. This is Desiree, your podcaster and the writer for AdramofOutlander.com. For all things Outlander, from the Dinah Gabaldon book series to the Stars TV series and everything in between. This is episode 75, The Scottish Prisoner, week 7. Hello, it's so fabulous to be with you. There's not much new in Outlander world this week, though Matt Roberts has been posting some beautiful pictures of South Africa and one terrifically scary one today. They were out scouting and came across a cobra. So follow him on Instagram at No Fooling Productions and you'll get to see all sorts of amazing things. He's has an incredible eye. Let's dive right on in. Chapter 13, By Darkness Met. Jamie was startled awake. It took him some time to orient himself to where he was. There was a female intruder in his room. She sat down beside him on the bed and touched his arm. The hairs bristled under the light touch of her fingertips. Forgive me for calling upon you unceremoniously. I thought it better to be discreet. It was none other than Minnie, Hal's wife, the Duchess. You think this is discreet? Holy God! She responds back to him by mentioning it would be not appropriate to meet at a Punch and Judy show, and he asks her if she'd be more comfortable sitting in a chair. He gets out of bed so he can go sit on the window seat. His shirt is tucked between his legs. He's wearing a nightshirt, so it's a little bit longer. He's all about propriety when it comes to women. I mean, how positively scandalous it would be to find Minnie, the Duchess of Pardlow, in his bedroom in the middle of the night, in her nightgown. Minnie, though, reminds me so much of a modern woman. She reminds me so much of Claire. And it likely has to do with the way she was brought the way she was brought up by her father. She was a spy working with him. She was probably the son he didn't have. And she was brought up acting like a man in a man's world, yet she's a woman. She's incredibly well-read, brilliant, smart, and I dare say she probably is discreet. During the Wednesday night Twitter chat, somebody brought up that maybe Minnie is a traveler like Claire. I tend not to think so. I think it's her upbringing, but who knows what Ms. Gabaldon will bring to us. In the future, I do, however, think that she and Claire would be grand friends. And I hope that happens at some point. So Jamie is wondering, why did she make the remark about the Punch and Judy show? Had his encounter with Quinn been seen? Was it mere chance for her to say this? Shall I light a candle? No, your grace. Jamie was backlighted by the moon. He could see her face, but she couldn't see his. It's an old trick. She sat, but didn't speak. Neither did Jamie, but he was thinking if the Duke knew. Yes, he does. Jamie nearly bit his tongue at her words. She must be very good at reading people as well. Oh, I... And may I ask just what your husband knows? Hal knows what her occupation was at the time they married. A man of blood and iron, then. That phrase means of war and will. Famously, it's been said about Otto von Bismarck, who was born in 1815. A little bit of timey-wimey phrasing for you. Jamie asks if Hal knows... She knew Jamie back then. He does, but not what she's coming to speak to him about tonight. Did he know she came to speak with him in his bedroom, he wondered? 
Minnie asked Jamie if he knows Edward Twelve Trees. He says he saw him briefly at the beefsteak that very day. Who is he, and why do I care? He's a soldier, a gentleman, and the younger brother of Nathaniel Twelve Trees, who Hal killed in a duel. And Jamie starts to ask about what duel, or what the duel is for, and Minnie said it's not important. The point is that the entire Twelve Trees family harbors feelings of the deepest hatred for my husband, well, for all the greys, but particularly Pardlow, and would do anything possible to damage him. The second point is that Edward Twelve Trees is an intimate of Gerald Siverly, very intimate. And the third is that for the last year, Edward Twelve Trees has been moving fairly large sums of money, far more than would normally pass through his hands. He's a younger brother and has no more than his pay and his winnings at cards. So Jamie is quite intrigued by this. Moving from where, where do they come from? All Minnie knows is they're going to Ireland, but she doesn't know where they're coming from. And Jamie starts thinking. He wants to know why she's telling him this. What is the point of that? So they discuss why she's bringing it to Jamie. She loves her husband and John and doesn't want either to get into a position where Twelve Trees family could cause harm to them. Here's what she says in particular. I want you, if at all possible, to see that that doesn't happen. If your inquiries in Ireland should lead you into contact with Edward Twelve Trees, I implore you, Mr. Fraser, try to keep him away from John. Try to see that whatever he's doing with Major Siverly doesn't intrude into the matter you're dealing with. So Jamie thinks he understands what she's saying, and he responds, You mean, whatever the money's about, even if it's going to or through Major Siverly, is not to do with the matters covered by the court-martial your husband wants, and therefore you want me to try to keep Lord John from following up any such trail should he stumble over it? Yes, that's exactly what she wants. She thanks Jamie and assures him any involvement with Twelve Trees would lead to a disaster. For your husband, his brothers, or your father? And she laughs at this. Her father always thought Jamie was the very best Jacobite agent. Was he still in touch? He says her father must have told her about the money or Hal and John would have brought it up when they were planning this with Quarry. At this, she made a, at this, she made a small sound of amusement, then rises to leave. If you keep my secrets, Mr. Fraser, I will keep yours. Hmm. After she leaves, he goes back to bed with caution. It smells of her and her body, though not unpleasant. It's unsettling to him, as was her last remark. But then he thinks it's merely persiflage. Persiflage is from French. Light and slightly contemptuous mockery or banter. Light raillery. Jamie thinks he has no secrets anymore, save for William and she couldn't likely know of his existence or his paternity. Then he hears the church bell ring. It's 1 a.m. He begins to relax. He thinks about the funds Twelve Trees is moving to Ireland, but there's nothing he could do just now. He was tired from being on his guard all the time in this nest of English. I envision him thinking a nest of English is something like a hornet's nest, not something nearly as nice as a robin's nest. <laughs> this chapter has very much figurative language and imagery abounds. Before 30 minutes have passed, Jamie is asleep again. John Gray had heard the same church bell tolling 1 a.m., 
He rubbed his eyes and put his book down. He'd been doing research. Several versions of the Wild Hunt tale by various authorities had been his reading. They didn't help at all with the version given to him by Carruthers. If he hadn't known Carruthers' passion at bringing Cyberly to justice, he would dismiss it as a mistake. But he did know him and knew it wasn't there by error. It is something incriminating even if he hasn't figured it out yet. As he rises, he's having thoughts of fairy hordes and dark woods and wailing of hunting horns in his mind. He takes the candle to head up to bed. He blows out the sconces that had been left burning for him. He notices that the nursery is now quiet after one of the boys had awoken earlier with a stomach ailment. The second floor wasn't lighted, but he could hear the soft footsteps. He saw Minnie in flowing white muslin step through the door into Hal's arms and the whisper of his voice to her. He didn't want them to see him, and he quickly moved up the stairs to the next floor. He paused waiting for them to retire. He thought one of the boys must have been sick again for Minnie to be up at such an hour. Huh. There was no noise coming from the floor above. The nursery was quiet and no noise from the floor below either. John was so close to catching Jamie and Minnie together, Minnie coming out of Jamie's room. He would have had many questions, I'm sure. The house slumbered. John was having a feeling of solitude. He alone was wakeful. He was Lord of the sleeping world. Then he hears a sharp cry cut into the night. He believes it came from the rooms on the left at the end of the corridor. Those were guest rooms. It was where Jamie was sleeping. He quietly walked toward Jamie's door. He could hear heavy breathing as if a man had wakened from a dream. Should he go in? No, he thought. He's free of the dream if he's awake already. He was turning toward the stairs and hears Jamie's voice. Could I but lay my head in your lap, lass? Feel your hand on me and sleep with the scent of you about me. Gray knew he should not be hearing this, but he dared not move in case he made a noise. He heard Jamie rolling over in bed and make some type of soft noise, a gasp, a sob maybe, but then it was quiet. He stood still, waiting. And then he slowly began to move and step away from the door. Then he heard a final murmur, a strangled whisper, Christ, Sassanok, I need you. He would have sold his soul in that moment to be able to comfort Jamie but there was nothing he could give. He hurriedly went down the stairs and then missed the last step, hitting hard. Poor Jamie still has nightmares. He still calls out to Claire. Over and over, she's ever present to him. And those moments, is that when Claire feels his presence in her own time? Because they both have this phenomenon that happens where they feel real and they're so connected that their love crosses those lines that we can't imagine. And poor John for hearing these words come out of Jamie, the sorrow, the ache, the need, and there's nothing that can be done for it. And then there's Minnie inserting herself into this thing that's going on. And John had just had that encounter with 12 trees after he was harassing Jamie. Ooh, what a tangled web we weave. Chapter 14, Fridstool. Jamie's head was spinning by the next afternoon. He needed some peace and quiet. He needed to think. 
The house was so busy it reminded him of the activity at Versailles. He explains in detail the flurry of activities all about the house and nearly running over servants and Tom Bird. He couldn't even sit in his room quietly because servants came in and out to do varying tasks. He was thinking of where he could go. Not to the park, too busy. He decided to go out into the house's garden. Remember, this is a mansion. Just last year, an elderly Anglican nun, Sister Eudoxia, had told him what a frid stool was. She was at Hellwater recuperating from an illness. She had the dropsy. And he was thinking that Claire never would have called it that, but the woman plainly had the disease. He came upon her. She was wheezing, her lips turning blue. He wanted to get help, but she, de but she declined. And as she let go of the railing and moved toward him, he had to catch her in his arms. She'd said she'd be all right and wanted to go out beyond the stable, and he was carrying this frail woman. And he noted that she weighed heavier, that she weighed more than he thought she would. He carried her there and gently deposited her upon a bench in the folly. A folly is a costly ornamental building with no practical purpose, especially a tower or mock Gothic ruin built in a large garden or park. Hellwater would fit that with the amount of acreage. And she's an interesting old nun. She says to Jamie, do you know, I believe this is the first time I found myself in a young man's arms. Quite a pleasant experience. Perhaps if I had it earlier, I should not have been a nun. Dark eyes twinkled up at him from a network of deep wrinkles, and he couldn't help smiling back. I should not like to think myself a threat to your vow of chastity, sister. She laughed, and it made her wheeze and cough a little bit. I didn't want to be responsible for your death either, sister. Should I not fetch someone for you, or at least tell someone to bring you a bit of brandy? You should not. And she reaches in a capacious pocket at her waist, withdrawing a small bottle. I haven't drunk spirits in no more than 50 years, but the doctor says I must have a drop for the sake of my health. And who am I to say him nay? Sit down, young man. He obeyed and sat down next to her. She sipped from the bottle and then offered it to him. And she insisted. He takes him and asks him what his name is. Alex Mackenzie's sister. He says he must go back to work and can he fetch someone? No, she says firmly. You've done me a service, Mr. Mackenzie, in seeing me to my fridge stool. But you will do me a much greater service by not informing the people in the house that I am here. He thinks she has an engaging smile. Are you not familiar with the term? Ah, uh, I see. You are Scotch, and yet you knew to call me sister, from which I deduce that you are a papist. Perhaps papists do not have fridge stools in their churches? Jamie doesn't think Scottish kirks have them, no. She goes on to explain it is a stool of sanctuary. And since she doesn't have a place of her own that's quiet and private, a place of retirement, she needed to find a footstool. And the folly that they were in was a mini Greek temple. And Jamie thinks a very good place for privacy. He was worried that she'd be cold. He didn't want her dying on him. In my age, Mr. Mackenzie, cold is the natural state of being. Perhaps it is nature's way of easing us toward the final chill of the grave. Nor would dying of pleurisy be that much more unpleasant, nor much faster, than dying of the dropsy, as I am. But it did bring a warm cloak, as well as my brandy. Jamie stops arguing with her. But he really wished that Claire could be there to give her opinion on this nun's health and maybe provide some sort of care for her. 
The nun sends him away. He says he'll come back to fetch her, and she agrees and asks him to come just before tea time. Now go away, Alex Mackenzie, and may God bless you and help you find peace. And in the present, he crosses himself thinking of her, much to the horror of the kitchen maids who saw him. Not only a Healand man in the house, but a papist too, he imagined them thinking. And then he spies the shed. Maybe that's a place of solitude. He thinks the gardeners were having tea. But he sees somebody bundled up on the floor sleeping. Somebody else was using this as a sanctuary space. He decides to go around to the back of the shed. There was a small space and an upturned bucket for sitting on. He had found it, his fritz stool. He finally felt alone as he sits and closes his eyes and his body relaxes. He says a brief prayer of repose for Sister Eudox's soul. He didn't think she'd mind a papist prayer after all. She had died two days after their encounter. And at first he was worried, but found out that she had passed peacefully in her sleep. He wondered if it would be okay to ask her to look after Willie while he was gone. It felt a bit heretical, but he felt answered almost immediately. With a feeling of trust or confidence or relief, he wasn't quite sure. He shook his head half in dismay. Here he sat in an Englishman's rubbish, talking to a dead Protestant nun with whom he had two minutes real conversation, asking her to look after a child who had grandparents and aunt and servants by the score, all anxious to keep him from the slightest harm. He himself couldn't have done a thing for William had he been still at Hellwater, and yet he felt absurdly, and yet he felt absurdly better at the notion that someone else knew about William and would help to watch over him. He then begins to really relax, and he realizes the only important thing in this whole imbroglio, this whole mess, was William. He wanted to get back to Hellwater, and that was that. He was feeling better, and he breathed deeply. He was running cyberly in Carruthers and the grays through his mind. He thought over John's reasons and Pardlow's. What was it truly for him? It could be all the things he came up with, and he didn't pretend to understand the complexity of Hal. He was alive only because of Hal's sense of family honor. But still, why him? Why did they need him specifically? Well, of course, the Wild Hunt letter had to be translated. And then he thinks about the control that the Greys have over him, and he bristles and doesn't like it, but he lets it go. Did they really need his help in getting Cyverly? John was a good soldier. It could be accomplished without Jamie for certain. Since it seems a straightforward matter, what did they think would happen? So Jamie's doing this stream of consciousness thing where one thing is building on the other and he's just seeing where it takes him. He's clearing everything out to come to some sort of answer. What if Cyrilly refused and used his means after resigning his commission to get clear of them? Jamie absolutely could be used in helping them find the man if he escaped. He could probably get along okay in the Gaelga, Irish Gaelic, to make connections where the Greys couldn't. Maybe his Jacobite connections would come into play in Ireland and they could open doors for Jamie the Greys had no access to. He concluded he might be useful, but with only the small possibility of Cyverly's flight, was it enough? So he's putting together puzzles and taking pieces out as they don't fit. Was it that Cyverly had saved John's life? He might want Jamie to haul him back to England, as John might be embarrassed to arrest him? He kept thinking on it. Now, a third possibility came into Jamie's brain. Cyverly might fight, and Cyverly might be killed. Jesus, Lord. What if Pardlow wanted Cyverly killed? The possibility once named seemed to assure to him as if 
he'd seen it written down in rhymed couplets. Whatever the Duchess had seemed to be saying to him in her nocturnal visit, there was something in the Cyverly affair that touched her deeply, and what touched her touched the Duke. He didn't know what the connection between Minnie and Edward Twelve Trees really was, but he knew something was there. And then he has the final thought that he is disposable. If he killed Cyverly, or it looked as if he had, he could be arrested and hanged. Or John could simply slit his throat once they were done with him. But then he thinks, it's just an annoying matter. He needs to do the work for Pardlow, so he can be returned to Hellwater, to William. At this point in Jamie's brain-clearing exercise... He opens his eyes to see John standing there, right in front of him, with his mouth agape. Jamie reacts rather badly to this. He stands up and yells, What the bloody hell are you doing here? And grabs John's shirt by the fistful. You are, without a doubt, the touchiest son of a bitch I have ever encountered. And I include in that roster such men as my brother and the king of Prussia. Can you not behave like a civil human being for more than ten minutes together? Touchy, is it? I grant you your situation is invidious. I admit the provocation, however. Invidious? Is that what you call it? I'm to be your cat's paw? To preserve what you're pleased to call your honor? And you call it provoking? Jamie is furious. What? What the devil do you mean by that? I speak English as well as you do, you bloody coward, and you take my meaning fine. So they're not very nice to each other. They're furious. Their rancor is up, and John tries to calm himself. But then he says to Jamie, Sit. I am not a dog. Gray apologizes for how it sounds and the implication. And then he asks Jamie to come with him, if he pleases, Mr. Fraser. He does follow John, and they go into the glass house, which is a big hothouse, greenhouse. And Jamie thinks it's beautiful. The smell of flowers hits him hard. He even smells Claire's hair. And it shocked him so much he has to take a gulp of air. John has had a long day and he wants to sit down. Jamie wasn't sure if he should leave or to punch John. But he decides to sit as well. John says they have at least a half hour of privacy in the here. Minnie is busy with Benjamin and Cook has already come for the vegetables. Benjamin is doing a recitation of Caesar. Jamie recognizes the passage, and of course he does. John wants to know what Jamie meant by his accusations. Jamie, who is a bit calmer now, couldn't find any reason to keep his conclusions to himself. So he tells John all the things that were going through his head, well, with the exception of things to do with Minnie visiting his room, and, of course, William. Gray listens. And after, he mutters, damn hell, under his breath. And there's a nod in here. There's a passage about vines being cut back, but now they're sprouting anew. Is this symbolism for the new growth in their relationship? That they're like fresh new plants again? This is a rebirth, a restart for them? I think so. And then John responds to all that Jamie said, right. You aren't a cat's paw to begin with. A stalking horse, perhaps, for what the assurance is worth. I had nothing to do with your presence here, let alone the notion that you should accompany me to Ireland. Do you believe that? Jamie does. But then John goes on to explain that he is the one to blame for Jamie being involved in the situation at all. Hal had wanted John to take the poem to Hellwater for Jamie to translate, 
and John had refused. So Hal, obviously, had taken matters into his own hands. John goes on to explain his interests in the matter and wants to know if Jamie believes him. He does. But what about the Duke, Jamie thinks? He doesn't let go of things, and Jamie may have noticed that. He had. And he is not, to John's knowledge, a murderer or unprincipled knave. And Jamie says he needs to take John's word on that. You may. He can and will, I'm afraid, use you to accomplish his ends regarding Cyberly, but those ends do not include either kidnapping or murder, and he intends you no harm. In fact, should this venture end in success, I think I can promise you that you will benefit from it. In what way? As to that, I cannot make specific promises without consulting my brother and perhaps other people, but I do promise that you will not be harmed by the association. So either Jamie will take John's word or not. The last time Jamie had taken Gray at his word, Jamie had come within an inch of killing him. They both remember that vividly. Now this is why Jamie was so angry with him in the stable back at Hellwater. Here's what John said to him. I tell you, sir, were I to take you to my bed, I could make you scream, and by God, I would do it. See? John is an alpha dog in a small man's body. I wonder, in John's mind, what made him say that, because we haven't ever gotten that perspective fully. And Jamie remembers having swung as hard as he could at John. But it wasn't really at John. It was at the memory of Black Jack Randall. The rape, the torture. And luckily he had missed hitting John. He sat now, not moving. The memory of violence that happened at Wentworth. Clear in his mind. They both sat without looking away from each other. The sounds of life around them where it was everywhere. And then Jamie asked John why he had followed him this afternoon. Gray, looking surprised, then answered, he didn't. He was looking for a quiet place for himself and just found him. Jamie took a deep breath and rose. I'll take you at your word. And left. So they're slowly rebuilding their relationship, whatever tenuous friendship that they had had. They have to start over. And one thing that's problematic in this, in this whole time period that he's really known, John Gray, John is in a position of authority, extreme authority and control over Jamie. And really in that position, John should have not said any of those things to him. He should never have disclosed his feelings for Jamie in any way. He should not have tried to sleep with him. Let alone Jamie's history that, of course, John does not know about. Together, it was a bomb that was going off inside of Jamie. But whatever that relationship was and the connection they had as friends and the respect they had, this is the launching off point for for it to move forward. Gray is getting dressed for the evening and he's feeling at peace, though it's been a long day and he feels like he climbed to a summit of, of an arduous peak and tomorrow there might be more mountains, but tonight supper would be eaten with an easy mind. Tom Bird was packing his things for the trip to Dublin. They were leaving the next day. John asked if Tom had packed for Captain Fraser. He had, except for the clothing that Jamie was wearing and a nightshirt. And he said he insisted he tried to get Jamie to powder his hair for dinner, but Jamie declined, saying it would make him sneeze. This made John smile. 
as John leaves the bedroom and is going down the hall, he runs into Hal. Hal was waving a small book. It was a copy of Quarry's book of poetry, certain verses upon the subject of Eros. It was a copy. It was not the finely bound original that John had given to Diderot. This copy was selling at half a shilling, and Hal had it purchased from a place called Stubbs Print Shop. Now, John hadn't read it. He'd only heard a few verses. So John flips open the book to a random page, and it says, Bent upon scratching his unseemly itch, this self filating son of a bitch. <laughs> Such terrible poetry. Hal gives a whoop and laughs so hard he needs to hold on to a wall. Self-filating? Is that even possible? You're asking me. I certainly can't do it, John says. I have not any personal experience in that regard myself, but dogs didn't seem to find it difficult. <laughs> Jamie had snuck up behind them and offers that remark. They swung around, having not heard Jamie's approach. And Joe thinks Jamie looks quite well. And he describes the means in which the clothing Minnie had gotten for him, how it, how it came to them. And it's not fashionable and not normally a wonderful color, but it looked quite nice with Jamie's coloring. It is possible, though, for a man, I mean. Hal asked Jamie how he came upon this knowledge. On one memorable evening in Paris some years ago, I was the guest of the Duke de Castellotti, a gentleman with individual tastes. He took a number of his dinner guests on a tour of some of the city's more interesting establishments, one of which featured a pair of acrobats, extremely flexible. Hal laughed and turned to John. They amusedly ponder whether Quarry has personal experience in this area. And Jamie is surprised to learn Quarry is the one who penned this book. And at this, Hal and Jamie walk beside each other down the corridor chatting, leaving John behind them holding the book and needing to follow. It turns out that Minnie was out for the evening. The men dined in pleasantness and friendliness. The air was light between them. Gray felt, really felt, that Jamie was, indeed, taking him at his word. Master me, or let me your master be. Oh, those stubborn words return. And then John thinks, mutual respect. He would settle for, in any case. He was actually looking forward to Ireland now. Well, that wraps up our two chapters. I do hope that Diana Gabaldon releases a book of bad erotic poetry. We've had some pretty delightful discussions during the Wednesday night Twitter chat about his poetry and some of the meaning. So this leaves off where the next day Tom Bird and Jamie and John will be heading over to Dublin and... They're going to try and track down Cyrilly. I do pause and wonder what happened to Tobias Quinn. What's Edward Twelvetree's true involvement? What are they going to find in Ireland? It's getting full of intrigue and mystery. It is. And it's going to speed up, for, really speed up from here on out. So, I just want to thank you for listening and for supporting the podcast by sharing it with other people by leaving reviews on iTunes by telling people to like the social media pages on Facebook it's a dram of outlander page there's also a private group that you have to ask to join that's called a dram of outlander and that's only for podcast listeners on Instagram and Twitter, it's Dram of Outlander. Of course, also, interact with each other. 
come and join the discussions, comment, share. You can call the listener line at 719-425-9444 and leave me a question, give me things to think about, comments. And the other way that you can support the show is financially. If you feel so led, you can make a one-time offering or through patreon.com slash a dram of outlander. You can do small monetary offerings every single month to help me with the upkeep and the production of the show. And next week we will be covering chapters 15 and 16. And Wednesday nights at 6 p.m. on Twitter is the hashtag A-D-O-O chat. You don't have to know how to use Twitter to join in and follow the fun. You simply need to have a Twitter account and then you click on search and you do the hashtag with A-D-O-O following and then click on tweets and you'll see everything we're discussing. It's a really fun smart, sometimes very body place to be. We don't hold any punches. We just, we go for it. So again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The listening numbers have been going up and up and up and I appreciate you. I'm almost hitting a goal I have and I can't wait to share when the show hits it. So until next time, slow java.